So what we um, thought to uh, discuss, um, one line doesn't show, so let's go here, is how to show today's art in historic buildings and in museums and to discuss the interaction between the modern and the historic. And then, sorry, the second point is really the main focus of our talk is like, okay, uh, why do we show modern art or contemporary art in a place like historic Cairo? Uh, uh, why in Islamic architecture? Uh, why in downtown Cairo? Maybe you have seen also the exhibition that is here in the Tamara building. Uh, um, so this is also something that we want to touch upon in, in our talk. And the other point is also Islamic art and architecture as an inspiration for today's uh, artists. How does that work and what are some of the new things um, happening? So I leave uh, the, the floor to Dr. Yannick. And just one thing to explain, we really did not plan this as a presentation, but uh, we thought just to guide the, the discussion, uh, Dr. Yannick will speak for a while, giving a bit on the international context. Then I will speak just a bit about historic Cairo, and then we will um, discuss, discuss the exhibition and other points. And. Uh, Sorry, excuse my very bad English. I will try to speak as fluently as possible, but uh, sorry about that. So, yes, uh, when uh, Nadine asked me to participate to this talk, um, my idea was also to start to give maybe uh, my point of view of uh, uh, the international context about this uh, historical heritage uh, face to today's art, and I should say maybe more precisely the French experience about it, or the European experience. Uh, this question of past heritage and uh, contemporary art uh, in the spotlight, as we say, of uh, uh, today's art, uh, started to be a question in Europe in the 50s. Uh, I, I will not uh, do uh, all the story of this, uh, uh, this debate, uh, questions and experiences in Europe, but I would like just to uh, give a name uh, to start uh, the story for me. It was uh, the Italian architect uh, Carlo Scarpa who tried to do uh, in a restoration process of old building, uh, the uh, dialogue with uh, new architecture. That's why uh, I wanted to start, of course, with the pyramid uh, that everyone knows as an icon now, built by Pei uh, inside the Royal Palace of the Louvre. And we will see later, and it can be also part of the debate, uh, when we say uh, past heri or historical heritage uh, uh, face to today's art, there are two types of arts with maybe some different uh, uh, questions, uh, that is architecture, the dialogue or the conflict between uh, uh, historical architecture and modern architecture, and of course, uh, what we can see today, uh, those days with uh, this event of Art d'Egypte, which is uh, art, uh, artworks uh, from artists inside the building. But uh, the debate uh, about uh, should we put, uh, is it a good idea to, to create uh, modernity with uh, uh, past and with uh, heritage, was really first um, uh, revealed uh, through this debate of architecture. And uh, Scarpa was the first to put very uh, modern architecture in uh, medieval buildings in a city like uh, Venice, uh, Verona, etc. Uh, no, uh, sorry, I'm, I speak too much, I no, think. No, 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 no. <laughs> I thought you meant. So, uh, of course, it was. Uh, interesting for me to replace this debate in France. Uh, the pyramid, uh, we celebrated this year his birthday, 
it, it was built 30 years ago, so it, it replaced us in the 90s. But really in the 80s, 90s, uh, this, uh, those experiences of uh, today's art in uh, historical monuments started really actively. Uh, and uh, what is interesting is that those uh, different experiences, uh, like uh, the, the decision to build, to, to choose Pei as the architect of the new entrance of the Louvre, was uh, done by uh, the president, François Mitterrand. It was his choice to create this dialogue between uh, historic, the, the uh, historical uh, palace, uh, royal palace of uh, France, and uh, this uh, very contemporary architect. Uh, what uh, is funny is uh, 30 years later, it's evident for everyone. There is no more question, is it a good idea, a bad idea? It, it becomes uh, natural and what we try to explain to the people that were against the pyramid uh, is learn to look around you because when you see all those buildings don't imagine that there are only two groups one the old ones and the pyramid which is the second group you have a history of architecture for the, the buildings of the Louvre uh, that started in the medieval uh, ages and uh, this building always uh, was transformed until today. So it's not uh, a conflict between past and uh, modernity, it's just a continuity. But what uh, I wanted to point out through this example that can be also a uh, uh, question about uh, some maybe uh, negative reactions uh, today uh, with this event uh, Art d'Egypte is that we ha it's interesting to have a long-term view. At the time, uh, it was a big debate in, in France. You cannot imagine the, the problem uh, uh, we had. Uh, Jacques Chirac, that was the mayor of the city, was really against. So the way to, to take the definitive decision without a new revolution was just to put uh, an artificial uh, shape of the future pyramid so that everyone could pass through and say, okay, the size is okay, it will not uh, uh, be so huge, etc. But it was really, at this time, a very, very uh, pre-revolutionary situation. And 30 years after, it's natural for everyone. So that's what I wanted to say with these uh, images. This is also interesting. Of course, this is the case uh, of uh, pieces of art and artists inside monuments, like we can see now in uh, Cairo with uh, Art d'Egypte. Of course, uh, it's also a, a symbolic images. Uh, I could have uh, chosen thousands of examples of uh, arti artists inside uh, mon uh, historical monuments. But uh, we are in Versailles, Chateau de Versailles, which is, uh, of course, the other symbol of the Royal Palace. Uh, and it's an exhibition from a Portuguese artist, a woman, uh, Jonas Vasconcelas, that uh, did this exhibition in 2012. Uh, it's in a uh, very important, uh, you can maybe show the other one, it's the so-called Hall of Mirrors, which is the most important place. And uh, I, just also to, to show you as a symbolic example of uh, uh, the way so here, the question is not more architecture. It's not more the dialogue of architecture. But it's another dialogue uh, with another uh, purpose behind to show today's art in this very famous 
Hall of Mirrors. Of course, the, the idea of the president of, Ver of Versailles to put uh, contemporary artists not only in the gardens, but also inside, in the royal apartments, uh, the, the Hall of Mirror, was not to say we need to have more public. They have four million people every year. It was not also to say we need money to restore you, you see, the whole of Miro's had uh, uh, fundraising and uh, has been restored. So it's not a, a question of using uh, today's art to uh, develop consciousness on the heritage. But there is another reason of such project, which is to develop a sort of new education of art, uh, which is to say, Okay, you go, you visit to, to see those buildings, those monuments, or those museums. And do you really see what you look at? <laughs> and the way to, to choose this artist, Jonas Vasconcelas is a, an artist using here for those monumental shoes, so she wanted to be monumental in Versailles, uh, is aluminum pots. So everyday uh, objects. So it, it was, uh, of course, uh, a way to, uh, to ask a question, to oblige people to ask themselves questions. Oh, why those aluminum tools, uh, those monumental shoes? It's, uh, the work is called Marilyn in, in, in this uh, hall. So the purpose of the president of Versailles was really uh, to develop uh, today's art inside the historical rooms of Versailles to uh, oblige visitors uh, to uh, just not uh, look their smartphones or the map uh, to see where they are in the castle, but just to be uh, surprised and, and uh, oblige them to ask themselves questions about what is what is art? Is it aluminum pots? Is it with mirror and uh, golden decorative uh, art? So it was another example of this type of context. And maybe to finish with uh, external uh, context, of course I, I wanted to choose uh, my department with this question of which is uh, uh, here also with uh, the exhibitions in our Egypt uh, event. The dialogue between Islamic art, uh, past Islamic art, and today's artists. Of course, it's a debate inside the debate, what is Islamic art uh, today? So we, we will not, I think, develop this debate today, but I wanted to show you, so here, uh, what you, you see is uh, two images inside our department showing um, uh, part of our Iranian medieval collection, a Seljuk collection. Uh, so here, uh, you, you see uh, the situation uh, with the different uh, showcases, and uh, on, on the left, you see those objects here, uh, which are one of the masterpieces. Uh, so this is the way the visitors can see the objects. And uh, maybe you know that this department opened in 2012 as a new department with a new architecture. And so it was a big event. It was a political decision from the president, uh, Jacques Chirac. It was opened by the president, François Hollande. It was very symbolic to open uh, an Islamic art department in the Louvre. So at this time, we wanted to create, uh, during the opening, uh, events. And we decided to invite an artist, Walid Rad. So maybe we can... So this is the result of the vision of Walid Rad. So what, what did he do? In the, Walid Rad is a Lebanon uh, artist. Maybe you know him. He lives in New York. And uh, he spent a few months with us in the department during the installation. So he could live with us. 
so it's the same case as uh, in, the, uh, in the exhibitions here. Uh, the artist creates uh, a specific work for the, for the context. Of course, the, sh the, the type of work can be very different from one artist to another. Here, the dialogue he wanted to create was not a dialogue with the architecture. It was a dialogue with the collection, uh, with the objects. So in the beginning, when we invited him, so of course it was the idea to say he has an Arabic culture, so maybe he will find some dialogue with our collections. In fact, this is the uh, liberty of each artist. The result was totally different uh, because the questions he has and the feelings he has he had was about the visual uh, dimension of the space. Uh, what was for him evident when he observed the space uh, uh, during the installation was the transparency of the showcases. And suddenly he thought, but what do the visitors really see on, on those objects? And I could say that it's a re reality. So, uh, it's a big problem uh, many times in museums to, to see how to check uh, things between the showcases in glass, the light, uh, and, uh, and sometimes uh, with irony, you would like to show the pieces on the best uh, way and uh, you don't see them. So he wanted to push this idea about uh, light, transparency, <coughs> and in fact that uh, you could you could not see the, real, the reality of those Islamic art objects. So those different images don't think that it's a problem of PowerPoint, <laughs> but it's really, uh, you, you have, uh, in fact, a superposition like an archeological uh, site. Here, uh, you, you see it's... Uh, I can show with this yes. if you want. Yeah. Uh, you, you can see here, it's a document of our archives this. and old photos of the first presentation in 1921 of our department. And you have in this superposition, like if the artist has a, how do we say, dizzy? Dizziness. Dizziness uh, of this vision of transparency, light, etc. So he, there is this superposition and the masterpieces are top down. Uh, so uh, I don't uh, ask the question, is it uh, nice or not? It's not the question, but uh, it's interesting to see another situation that the Louvre wanted really to reveal is how a contemporary artist can enhance on another way, but uh, an academic way with labels, etc., this collection. And believe me, this is an important question in museum. Uh, how can we make it more uh, understandable uh, for people? Uh, we see every day that uh, it's not easy to understand things in museums and labels don't, uh, are not enough. Uh, so, whose type of uh, performance of artist can be really for us uh, a way to develop curiosity educations? Yes, and it was just, sorry, another example of, of this dizziness of this artist in front of our Islamic art collection. Okay, so now we just move to the second part. Uh, but before that, I, will, I just want to um, give a brief about the context of today's exhibition, I mean, or this month's exhibition of uh, Art d'Egypte, uh, which is Historic Cairo. The exhibition is taking place in Historic Cairo, and in just one street of it, and as much as this street is very important because it's El Muizz Street, which is uh, the founder of El Qahira, uh, or Cairo as we call it today, we have to bear in mind that this city has a very, very long history. I'm not going to the uh, pre-Islamic era at this stage, but uh, even if we think about uh, the, the, what we call today historic Cairo, it started with the foundation uh, of El Fustat, which is the area now where there is Coptic Cairo. 
um, and uh, it started to move north uh, with the Abbasids, then with Ahmad ibn Tulun building the, the great mosque that is still standing today from the 9th century. And it was the Fatimids actually in the 10th century who really founded and built Al Qahira with, for those of you who have been uh, and know it well, with the northern walls and the southern walls with Bab al Futuh and Bab al Nasr and uh, Bab Zuwayla in the south. And there were many other gates to this city which you can see uh, here. Um, and the exhibition is, has been taking place here. Uh, and since then, the, city, the, the different uh, areas of this uh, city were getting connected. So we have the area of El Darb al Ahmar correct, connecting the Beb Zuela area all the way to the, to the citadel, which was built in the 12th century. And then, of course, we had other different expansions. So what we have today is historic Cairo is really an agglomeration of different uh, uh, cities. And then we had, of course, the modern uh, period with the 19th century in the area where we are uh, here today. Uh, and so, so, so the city has a very, very long history. Uh, it was always expanded, the uh, buildings changed, uh, uh, but we can see that a lot of it actually didn't change. So, for example, the urban setting itself, uh, some people, if you see maps produced by the Description de l'Egypte, uh, we see that some street fabrics still remain the same. Um, the city obviously has so many different values uh, in terms of historic or artistic, uh, but also intangible. And as uh, an appreciation to that, in 1979, uh, Historic Cairo was inscribed on the World Heritage List. Uh, this is a very long process that I'm not going to discuss today. But the main reason to inscribe a city or a monument uh, on this list is because what UNESCO had agreed upon to call uh, an outstanding universal value. So a value that uh, transcends the national uh, values and moves into the international and, and the universal. Um, we know it as the city of 1,000 uh, minarets. And I like to show this photo because it's uh, also quite uh, beautiful. Uh, I've worked on the restoration of one of uh, the buildings. We worked on the lighting. But I always like to say, well, this is not the whole picture, actually. Uh, even if we want to see this beauty, this is part of the real picture. Uh, historic Cairo is a living city. It has its problems like any other part of different uh, cities with uh, construction, uh, deconstruction, uh, and so on and, and so forth. Um, and it's a, it's a living city. There are people living there. Uh, they continue their activities all the time with the selling, with the buying, with praying in the mosques. And it's a city where the tangible, as we call it internationally, let's say, these tangible monuments uh, in terms of buildings and so on, coincide and co-live with the intangible, the traditions that continue. And very often when I uh, show this picture um, to people studying um, heritage and restoration and management, they're like, but what is this? I mean, it, no, all this has to go. I mean, uh, how can the people be like that in the street and so on? But if we even read the chronicles who have written about Cairo or the travelogues, the travelers who wrote travelogues, they always called about Cairo as the hustle and the bustle and a living and a very vibrant city. Uh, yes, we can manage things in a way that doesn't damage the building, but at the same time, there are people living there, and this is what has actually made this city continue to live. So for a very long time, there was an idea to have Cairo as an open-air museum. Uh, one of, some of the advantages of such a thing, and I think we will touch upon that also later, is that, of course, this led to um, a great number of restoration projects in certain areas, but there were several other restoration projects, if you're interested about that in the discussion, I can tell you about them. Uh, in different parts of, 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 the, of, the, of areas. And as one of the results of, uh, of this, do you want to you say something about that, yeah? Uh, of course, my, my point of view is always uh, 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 about what I, I have seen uh, elsewhere. And uh, of course, the question to say, maybe you heard about the debate of Venice, uh, Venice, Venice. Venice. Yeah. Venice. Uh, or uh, uh, I remember having um, um, had uh, I had a lot of discussion with the mayor of Napoli because it's the problem of all those historical city centers. Uh, should we uh, 
uh, organize them as a museum. Uh, that means uh, put people outside or not. Uh, it's a question. If you want my opinion, uh, I, I will not say I hate museums, but uh, we have enough museums. So we have to find solutions uh, with people inside. And I hate this idea that uh, past heritage is died, uh, is dead. Uh, so maybe you will also have some reactions about this. But yeah. uh. so, um, as a result of what some of the restorations, is that really um, El Moaiza Street has uh, taken a lot of attention. Um, uh, this is Sher Al Moaiz in another event many, many years ago. Not many, yeah, many years ago, more than uh, nine years ago, maybe. Um, because also at that time, other uh, initiatives, for example, brought an exhibition to uh, um, historic Cairo where furniture were, was displayed also in these um, different places. Um, um, so, yes, one of the advantages of this is that. Uh, like also the event at, uh, at, La, at, at the exhibition of Ahd Egypt, is that some people who have never visited historic Cairo, who have lived in this city, were born in this city for years, have never visited the site. And that was one of the first times for them to be encouraged by something else, something different, something that relates to them. They go to exhibitions or they go to furniture fairs to come to this um, uh, place. Um, uh, but this is also the same street uh, at a different uh, moment. And um, uh, this was at a time when um, there were no regulations um, in, in the street. And um, I don't think any of the solutions, um, any of the views is a possibility for a long term. Uh, so of course, there is this very big problem of how to deal with a city like Cairo with all the challenges that it has uh, either economically, uh, socially, politically, and so on, uh, in a way um, that respects all the interest uh, uh, groups. So some people call interest groups stakeholders. We can call them whatever we want. And I think we need, in Egypt, really creative solutions uh, that do engage with the various interest groups, be it uh, the local community, the people who worship still in uh, these mosques, be it the shop owners, uh, be it the art scenes and the artists who are interested, be it the scholars who are studying these buildings, or, and importantly, very importantly, of course, the different ministries, the Ministry of Antiquities, Tourism, uh, the Cairo Governorate, who are an important player in, in this. So uh, this is really one of the, the questions that is raised not only for a city like Cairo, but very much for a city like Cairo. And there have been really several initiatives. Today we're focusing on the exhibition at, uh, of uh, Ahd Egypt, but there have been several initiatives with um, international institutions, with local uh, uh, bodies, with uh, local NGOs that have worked not only on El Moaiza Street, but in several other areas, trying to bring these different stakeholders uh, together uh, in order to make sure to preserve these buildings. And one of the things I want to stress is that if any building does not have a value for the people, uh, it will not survive. Um, if historic Cairo was not uh, a living city uh, that was with its mosque, with its streets, with its tradition, valuable and important for the people, it would have become a ruin. And it's not. And I think this is the thing that we need to capitalize on when we think about things to do with this city. So I think now we will move to the discussion part. And I think it would be nice if people talk to us. So for those of you who haven't seen the exhibition, yes, we're promoting <laughs> that you go and, and see the exhibition. Um, uh, very much to see, I think, uh, uh, the points that uh, Dr. Yannick just also raised. Um, and these are the points we want to discuss. Um, first of all, what's the benefits of having such an exhibition in historic uh, Cairo, in certain uh, monuments? Uh, how, and I think this is a very personal th thing, we didn't want to put um, uh, photos of, uh, of, of the exhibition itself uh, because we think everybody has to go and see it for uh, themselves. Um, but also we wanted to talk about this, um, the, the harmony, uh, uh, how would you feel with certain pieces that they were in harmony with the building? Uh, do you manage to enjoy the space and the pieces at the same time, or do you feel that 
um, the, pace, the spaces take from the monument, from something from the monument, or when you go, you were overwhelmed with the monument and not see the building. And um, yeah, the, the this is the some of the points that we want to uh, to, to speak about, um, and also the inspiration. And we will. These are maybe the lines. So. I let you shoot in and then I will. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think we can have another question. I don't know what are your reaction for those who have seen the exhibitions, but uh, it's also uh, with Kalaoun, it's also the question of religious monuments with non-religious art inside or uh, this dialogue, uh, even if the artist tries to adapt their works they adapt it uh, with the architecture. Uh, but uh, what I have liked, I should say, in Kalaoun is it's uh, the very delicate choice of the places uh, in which the artists are. Uh, so we, we, I can imagine a lot of debate, a lot of uh, uh, stress about this, but uh, we, we have, we had the same uh, uh, questions with uh, art in uh, churches in, in France. And uh, so this is also a question inside the question of historical monument in yeah. spotlight of, yeah. of art, uh, yeah. of today's art. Yeah, actually. when we were talking about it, um, uh, you know, before the talk, we were discussing that in Egypt, uh, religious building continue to exist as religious building, with the exception of some monuments in, his, in, in, in Shara al Mois. But generally, um, I was working, for example, with several organizations on restoring religious buildings. And whenever we finished the restoration of any 14th century, 13th century mosque, it was returned back because it's the function that will make sure that these buildings survive. The problem lies with secular buildings whose functions cease to exist. So if you have a palace, or a sabil. Uh, sabil is, a, for those who don't know, a place where they used to give water uh, to the people. So what do you do with these buildings? And in the exhibition, for those who haven't seen it, the only building with a religious nature, nature uh, uh, out of the four buildings where there is the exhibition is Kalawun. Uh, it's not used at the moment um, for religious uh, practices. That was a decision, I think, between the, Auka, the Ministry of um, uh, antiquities, or at that time, maybe uh, not, um, and probably the, I'm not really sure how it worked with the Ministry of Aukaf, which is the Ministry of Religious Endowments. Uh, but what we noticed in, in Kalawun especially is that the pieces uh, were in harmony with the function and the, of the spaces, you know, so the, the Kalawun complex has the madrasa and it has the hospital uh, and, and most of the pieces uh, try to capitalize uh, on, on this uh, thing. Uh, but I think, yeah, when it comes to really functioning religious buildings, that would have been a totally different uh, question. That means also, even if we are not here to discuss about the artists and the quality of uh, the artists, but uh, of my feeling is that it's really uh, amazing result because uh, for those types of events, uh, it's not on, uh, just uh, the, uh, the decision to say we will put today's art inside a historical building. This is, in fact, very easy. You have so many artists that want to be uh, seen and uh, so many buildings. But what is always uh, something very, very difficult is to find the good artist that will fill the place and uh, and have a, a result that becomes evident for everyone. Uh, if you have to explain things, it's uh, I think that means that uh, it's not uh, uh, a good result. Uh, but. Uh, I think it's important when, uh, if uh, we want to develop such events that are important for education, for consciousness, for uh, uh, attractivity of uh, this problem of heritage, etc. But we have to be perfect in the realization, because if not, 
of course, uh, it's uh, easy to have uh, uh, negative uh, messages uh, around this also. Yeah, and um, yeah, one of one of the things that uh, we didn't manage visiting the exhibition to talk to all the artists, of course. I mean, it's there. There are many of them, uh, but it was in very interesting to know that um, the artists were taken to these uh, spaces, and uh, if I understand correctly, they felt the inspiration with certain spaces and they designed the pieces accordingly. And uh, this is a very important dialogue. I mean, for uh, artists who are well established, but I think also with the side activities that uh, Art Djib did, did or where some other initiatives, they try to let people look at, at the heritage with a different uh, view and uh, you can get inspiration by that. And now there are international prizes for uh, artists being inspired and being inspired doesn't mean copying, but the, the thing is, is this the inspiration and making it harmonious with, uh, with the building and that is something that I think is quite a debatable um, uh, issue, but also maybe one of the things that uh, we were just discussing before um, uh, the, the talk today is uh, also uh, artist and the inclusion, uh, ar the artist as a designer and the artist as the person who produces uh, something. And we saw, for example, that um, with this exhibition, but also with previous exhibitions, that uh, now craftsmen are also being brought in because some of the pieces uh, are not any more uh, small pieces where the artist um, is making uh, them himself or herself, but where craftsmen are brought into the equation. And I think this is something that um, in the future will need to be addressed even more. Uh, okay, what is this piece, you know, and um, the, the different actors. So, we, I mean, I actually, it would be nice to hear also from some of the artists uh, here their own experience about either being the artist and the makers, or the artist and working with the, the, the craftsmen. So that would be also uh, something to, to think about, because in a way one can see in relation to Islamic architecture, for example, that there is a revival also of also crafts that would have been otherwise uh, not existent. Um, uh, yes, just to react to, to your comments, uh, it's really a personal uh, vision, but uh, uh, so it's the debate about what is Islamic art today. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I think on an economic point of view, it can be interesting that uh, artists uh, reveals again traditional uh, craftsman uh, work, of course. Uh, but uh, we have to be careful that uh, 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 creation, uh, uh, today creation, uh, has not to be only, it, it can be, but it has not to be only the revival of uh, tradition. But it's a very personal yeah. uh, uh, position. Uh, so I don't know, uh, it's, I uh, uh, yes, uh, okay. I think what can be interesting is really to have also a dialogue with you, because as you have seen, uh, we don't have really very uh, really real answers. It's a talk about questions uh, revealed by these events, and uh, I think it's always very uh, also interesting to have debate around uh, those questions uh, of uh, this dialogue between uh, historical uh, uh, heritage and uh, today's art. The, is it useful uh, for what, etc.? So uh, I know that there is never a first question, Some, but somebody, uh, ah, somebody has is. a question okay. in the back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you very much for the lovely presentation. So I've, I've always been wondering. Uh, of course, the initiative is an amazing initiative to, to increase the awareness of um, Egyptian heritage and Islamic heritage, per, uh, to be specific. But what I notice from places such as uh, Napoli and uh, places you mentioned that um, live within the heritage city, or let's say Fez, Fez in Morocco, 
uh, is that they don't treat their heritage as, as, as a celebratory thing. It's an everyday thing. Yeah. So, I mean, what are the efforts or, or, or the what is the direction that the public se sector, private sector, government should, should aim to, to be able to actually revive the, the historic city w and the awareness of, 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 of people like, like ourselves who usually live, I'm talking about myself, mostly uh, around the Malik, Mohandesin, uh, and the, the new parts of Cairo. Um, of course, if the solution would have been simple, uh, it would exist. <laughs> so uh, we have all to be modest about uh, such complex situation. So if I compare of uh, uh, cities like uh, Napoli, uh, Venice, what did they do? Napoli, the question was different as in uh, Venice. Venice, the problem, as you know, is uh, uh, the massive tourism, uh, I should say the industrial tourism, uh, with the big boats coming inside the city. So they have to fight, which is a little strange, against tourism. Uh, of course, I know that Egypt is also uh, very well known for tourism, but I think less in Cairo than in of a part of Egypt. So I feel that uh, uh, Cairo is uh, more uh, um, the same as Napoli. It means how can this heritage live with the people inside? And Napoli, uh, there were some initiatives uh, 20 years ago that uh, were fruitful. It was really, of course, you can put a lot of money. Uh, money is a problem, of course, always uh, to restore monuments. So you have to find money. And uh, I know that here, uh, the Minister of Antiquity uh, tries to think about the uh, partnership, public uh, institution, and private uh, in initiative. And uh, this is, I think, very important also to develop. But uh, uh, what seems for me important is uh, to learn people to live every day with this heritage. It means to respect it. Uh, and this, uh, he, he did uh, very nice, he had a very nice idea. He wanted to work with the schools, saying people have to uh, appropriate uh, their own heritage. It's not uh, the heritage of someone else, I it's their own heritage. And they have to learn to appropriate it. So he decided to create a partnership between each school of Napoli, of the center, uh, historical center, with a monument saying, this school is in charge of this monument. And uh, everything was symbolic. There, is, there was a ceremony uh, during which the, all the children of the school received the key of the monument. It was not the real key, it was a, uh, a, a symbolic key. But you will be, during one year, during two years, in charge of this monument. And uh, in fact, wha what does it mean? I, uh, they were involved uh, during the restoration process, they could come before everyone else to see the restorers working uh, on the monuments. And so they were, they felt uh, uh, involved in the project and they were so excited that during the evening they spoke with their parents. They were very proud to say, I know, you don't know, but I know what's happened in this monument. And uh, such process, we did it also when I was uh, uh, in charge of uh, education and heritage for the Minister of Education. I did such a thing everywhere in France also. Because, uh, of course, it's not the only solution. The, the, the problem is complex. But you have to start processes all those things are very long-term processes. But uh, if you, uh, we can see it here in Cairo, but we can see it elsewhere, uh, some monuments were restored. 
But it's not because it's restored, but it's, uh, it remains in a good shape. Yeah. So uh, if you want to, to come in a positive uh, movement, it's really to work a lot with people. And I think that uh, uh, we are not here to make publicity <laughs> for the exhibition, but I think we are convinced <laughs> both by the, the event. Such, uh, such an exhibition is also the beginning of a process of co consciousness saying, okay, uh, I can't uh, uh, now uh, walk uh, through all those monuments. I have to stop to see the lights, to see uh, the events inside, and to ask myself uh, what is my link with this uh, place. Okay. Yeah. No, and, and just to build uh, on that, I mean, there have been so many initiatives happening in, in Cairo uh, with different organizations, as I said, working with kids, wor uh, others working with uh, people from the Ministry of Antiquities, others working with different government bodies. Uh, so yes, of course, such an event, you know, this is one uh, of the initiatives. Um, and I think all of these people have to work together. Uh, but I think that the main thing is that uh, due to the complexity of the problem is I think it has to be also a national project. It has to be within the national agenda of Egypt not only to take care of Cairo, but also there are, we have so many other cities that are just crumbling, unfortunately, all uh, um, to the south, to the north, to the east and to the west. So unless it becomes a national project to really first educate uh, us, you know, uh, because I always like to give uh, this example, uh, we were not born loving heritage, right? I mean, I don't think, uh, I was born and I said, well, I, I felt I want to work in, in culture, but uh, I think uh, I always like to say that uh, heritage is like a diamond in the hand. Uh, you might think it's a piece of glass, right? If you were not taught, oh, this is, by the way, a diamond, you would just throw it away. And I think um, it has education of heritage and its value has to be a national project with all the different private initiatives, institution initiatives, and so on, but it has to be a national uh, project, but uh, unless this takes place, um, I think it will be very problematic. So hopefully with initiatives like this, also on different levels, uh, the value of such buildings will, will, be, uh, will be clearer, um, and it would m have the uh, effect of being a catalyst for more such things. For example, in the past, reusing, and it's, it remains a problem till today, but reusing historic buildings for purposes other than cultural activities is very difficult in, in Egypt. So reuse, um, I remember a long time ago we had a discussion with some people and it was like, what? You, you want to re reuse a historic monument as if the monument is untouchable? Yeah, the, the monument only survived because it was being used. So, for example, residency for <laughs> artists or non-artists in Wikelas that were anyway used for uh, people to stay and to live. Yes, we would have problems with the sewer and with the electricity and so on, but if we work on re-adapting such places, um, uh, it, they can be reused for daily purposes. It doesn't have always to be related to culture or to arts and so on. It can be also for daily activities. And I think this is um, a turning point that we did not yet reach. So already we have one turning point where, yes, now we can reuse uh, monuments for several activities. This has started already and maybe in the future such buildings will just become buildings that are allowed. So I think we need to move away from the building as the monument where the building just becomes part of, the, like you said, maybe the daily life, you know? Other questions? Comments? Yes. <laughs> Comments? <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's such an interesting topic. Uh, but uh, maybe I will start with what you were saying. It has to be a national uh, uh, unfortunately, we, we, we can allow ourselves to be realistic. It will not be a national issue soon. So let's think of initiatives that are doable, that we can somehow go about. I'm sure Art Egypt is, an, is, a, is a good in initiative. 
and uh, I hope it is replicated. But uh, until then, maybe what we can do is uh, try to think of alternatives uh, that can work. For example, I totally agree with you, Dina. Uh, it has to be lived in. It has to be, uh, to be uh, propriety has to happen. But actually, uh, the, the way now that we talk about historic Cairo is that people live in it and it's the best place. It is true to an extent because the merchants are abusing historic Cairo now. They are uh, pulling down buildings that are of worth, not historic, uh, to create ugly apartment buildings to make them the warehouses because, because they cannot have their own warehouses in the world. So maybe small, small uh, issues uh, that we can tackle. I don't even have an idea of how to do it, but uh, dividing it might make us think in a more creative way. Uh, could be our contribution because I really don't see a national policy saying how we can save historic Cairo. Yeah. It is not on, on, yeah. on, on the agenda. Yeah. yeah. Uh, a minor yeah. thing also, you said the, that the best example was Qalawun. I felt so too. And actually, I thought about it. Why is it the best thing? I think because some of the artists respected the nature of the place. Ahmed As Alani told us that he did a sibha. I don't know what's a sibha in English. Yeah. yeah. He, he, told, he told us that when people came, came in, people from the street living, you know, they thought it, was, it has been there for ages. It wasn't for the exhibition. And uh, yeah. I thought this was very indicative. Uh, also, of course, Sodo Rutfi, being an artist slash historian, she did something that respected the nature of how the, the building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think this this enriched. Uh, by the same context, my personal opinion, Ahmed Farid wasn't very, very successful. Beautiful art, but is really hit the the surrounding. It didn't blend with it. So, but yes, Dina, using the secular uh, secular buildings in in in, in non-religious is, is a great idea I hope we we continue but the restaurants in historic monuments Bardu <laughs> I, I <laughs> didn't say restaurants. <laughs> yeah, <sorry. no. laughs> I yes. alluded to it but I didn't <laughs> say it <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay but, uh, I think you are uh, you, you uh, I agree totally with you but uh, it, it will not be magic from one day to another yeah. with a uh, public uh, willing uh, but uh, so we, that's why we have to be modest, but we have to fight if we are convinced. And uh, more you will have initiatives, the more mm. uh, the people that uh, want to have modern buildings, the contractors, etc. Of course, we are weak uh, with those people. We don't have to be naive. Uh, but uh, I think that uh, the process is slow. But it has to start. It has start. Yeah. I think. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I think what we've reached, or at what you know, and to have an exhibition like this today, is in fact a result of the work of so many other people who were, you know, maybe some of them have died already, but who have really started a long time ago to uh, um, see the value of these uh, of these buildings and. Um, also very recent projects, so for example, World Heritage. It was not a subject at all until uh, there were uh, several initiatives internationally and uh, also nationally, because 10 years ago, if you s said to somebody working in certain ministries that certain cities in Egypt are World Heritage sites, they wouldn't first know what is a World Heritage site, and they also wouldn't know how many World Heritage sites and so on. And um, UNESCO with, with developed uh, a very good program, and I, I taught several people at the Ministry of Antiquities. And what was very nice is that, yes, there was this uh, realization that, yes, we have not been capitalizing of the, uh, the fact that historic Cairo is a world heritage site. We have several others, but not uh, enough. But again, the idea with world heritage is not to have so many world heritage sites. The idea is to really manage these world heritage sites. So, there has been this very uh, long process. Um, but what I wanted to say is that all these small initiatives, I think, are very important. Um, and with an exhibition like this one, 
making people see that, oh, there is something there. So for example, I remember in one of uh, the courses I gave to somebody, uh, to people from the community one time, a person told me, you know what? Uh, I was talking to my brother the, the other day and I explained to him everything about this building because all we knew about this building is bus number da -la 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 stops here and we never looked at the building, you know, because it's, it's, it's really, they didn't see the diamond, it was just there. So I think, yes, the, 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 the different initiatives are important, but I do think that with such a big thing and with other initiatives, there is the pressure of saying, uh, uh, to the government and so on, that this is important. Uh, it was very interesting, for example, the debates that were stirred around the bust of uh, the, the mask of uh, Tutankhamun when uh, it was badly restored or uh, other sites. It was one of the first times when we hear in Egypt debates about heritage uh, and people writing, even without enough knowledge, but still, I think it was already a very healthy thing that people started to think about it and, and debate about it. So debates that were happening in France 30 years ago maybe are happening here today and hopefully this will result in uh, a different realization of how to deal with, with these things. But um, yeah. Um. What I can tell you, uh, maybe we started before in France, but we still have some contractors that uh, buy uh, places and, uh, and uh, repl replace the old building by new. So we als always will have this problem, but uh, it's a question of pressure, uh, I think you're right, and uh, again of education. You see, what I like in Italy, uh, when you go in Italy, in a, in a small city and you want to understand a monument, a church or something, you can ask to the butcher. <laughs> he will know something about his heritage. Yeah. So, uh, and this, uh, I really think that uh, you can have, uh, uh, my minister of education, Jacqueline, always told me you know, it, uh, the educative system in France, uh, I suppose it's the same here, you have schools everywhere. You have millions of schools. So if it's like a big army, and if you want to, to have power on education of heritage, do it in schools, because it's the beginning of this process, uh, again, of uh, uh, appropriation and, uh, and so. Uh, to be proud about this. And I also think this issue of the reuse is, is quite interesting yes. because, for example, I remember the first time coming from this background that we can't use historic uh, monuments and so on, and us trying to just work on, for example, putting a small... Uh, I remember I was working with uh, some projects and they just want, wanted to put a bookstore in a historic building that was not uh, used. It was a secular, uh, non-religious building, and it was uh, impossible. Um, also because of the lack of administrative system within this, the, the, the government of generating revenue and so on and so forth. So I think these are things where people will have to work a bit more uh, in the government to see how this can, can be done. Um, but, uh, but then I went, the first time I went to Syria, I was so surprised that their, their older caravanserais were used either as hotels or as restaurants, and it's th the issue is how to maintain it and manage it in a way that the water supply and the drainage and so on does not destroy, and that people also entering and living, stay, sleeping in such a room, it's not the most comfortable because they are all very small. So <laughs> some people would prefer big hotels, but it's really quite uh, quite a special uh, thing. So I think this is also possible, but um, it has to be managed well. I see some. Uh, I think there is a last question. question. Here ah? one here. Okay. Yeah. If the, we can. The oh. Okay. It's okay. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, the, to raise awareness. It's very good on the on the on the right pace. I mean now, but uh, having this. Uh, 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 this display, for example, for temporarily uh, time, 
that it's not enough to raise awareness of people. Yeah, for example, I know that Makad Mamai Saifi and um, uh, the whole of Muhabbidin, it's closed. And uh, they told me that it's open only for during these uh, two weeks, for example, of the exhibition only. Yeah. So, and even a few people who, who have the, uh, I mean, the, the problem of propaganda also to, to, uh, to have uh, not a few people to know this uh, display. No, we have to uh, raise awareness on, on uh, to cover uh, yeah, a category more, more also to see this. If you want, if, if we want to raise awareness among much, much people uh, to, to, to know. Yeah, for example, there is a permanent uh, use for the heritage, like you say, Lghori, Wakalat Lghori, Wakalat Bazarga, because there is offices, office of governmental. Uh, of the antiquities. So this is open all the time. But having for two weeks only, yani, on, and also few people who, have, for example, I receive an email by, by, yani, by my faculty, for example. So it's... Uh, you, you're totally know. right, but uh, you, you know, we have an interesting example in France. Uh, in 1981, we started uh, this uh, event called uh, the Days of Heritage, which is every third weekend of September, so only two days. But uh, the idea was, uh, so in 1981, to say during this weekend, we open, so it was managed by the Ministry of Culture, but uh, the idea was to say uh, all the public uh, monuments, but also the private for uh, the owners that uh, want, can open the doors to everyone during one weekend to see what they cannot see during the rest of the year. I can tell you that it's still, now it's uh, a European uh, weekend, and it's very, very popular. You have fa uh, uh, millions of people going to see. Uh, that means also that, uh, uh, of course, we cannot open everything every, everywhere. Uh, it's uh, sad. Sometimes we can be angry when we come to see something, and it's closed, of course. But one solution is maybe, and I'm sure that Nadine, uh, uh, with Art Egypt, has uh, enough energy to develop what is now still a small project, uh, but I know that for her it's not a one shot, but to repeat it, even if it's only a few days, but to repeat it each year and to give the, the reaction to open, even if it's just a few days each year, but to give this, uh, uh, this possibility. I like very much the idea of reusing the, the historical buildings, and I think we have a few examples. But I, uh, the examples are, for instance, the Omar al-Khayyam uh, Palace, which uh, we were devastated. It was going to be a hotel, but that kept it. If it was closed until today, it would have yeah. been ruined. Uh, Mena House is the same thing. But I think the, the solution is, I mean, uh, uh, thinking that the government or having a national project, I think it's... Uh, it's a bit romantic because even the government today is in real estate. So, so the, the competition with real estate is, is impossible. I think the best use is a commercial use of it. And, and I think a recent example I was surprised to know was, for instance, the iconic Italian consulate in Alexandria that was taken over by a bank, used as a headquarter, the Alex Bank, which is owned by Italians. And, and taking the French example, uh, as iconic as the Champs Elysees is, the Gardelin shop at the Champs Elysees is using an old building, and I think this is something uh, Europe has succeeded in doing, where they're using historical buildings in commercial aspect. And I think, uh, and when you say about uh, heritage being across the country, of course, a, a considerable part of it has been wiped out, like in cities like Asyut, where we had villas. I mean, Cairo, for people yeah, who have never, who think Cairo is in the 19th century, was the middle class government employees. The wealth of Egypt was in Mansoura, Asyut, uh, Suheg, Minya, and there were mansions, uh, uh, palaces, to, I mean, to be compared with Versailles. Uh, and, and, and a good part of it was why? Because of real estate. Uh, I take the example of Asyut. 
and, and there is a, hu a, a beautiful uh, palace there, the Alexand Palace on the Nile, that was about, to, it was bought, as a matter of fact, by a real estate developer, the Syndicate of Agriculture, that was going to be removed and be ugly towers. Luckily, the government intervened, but again, it's one of a hundred other things that are still things, and I think the commercial use is, is uh, so uh, c companies uh, need to also move, companies now want to make uh, banks, for instance, uh, there are dozens of them in, in Asyut, one of the city, main cities, and all of them went to what? Modern buildings. Yes. Uh, so uh, stupid thing, yani, yani, while there yeah. are these villas that are closed and falling in ruins, yeah. uh, uh, and what I, I just want to clarify what I mean by national project or national, I, I mean there should be the national willingness. I don't, and on the contrary, I don't think that everything has to be owned or managed by the government. Uh, I think there should be the encouragement of uh, saying that not each and every monument has to be just a monument and managed by the government no, because no. it's it is the, but it has to be there has to be the national willingness and the national assistance for such things to happen because of we the all private sector of the private sector no but also there has to yes you can encourage the private sector but i think you have to also allow for rules and regulations to make this possible because i mean many of the people also sitting here can tell you of examples where people tried to reuse a historic building uh, not even to uh, buy it, just to use it, and it was really mission impossible. So this, the, the exhibition is a temporary thing, but if we think about long term, uh, we need to find the rules and the regulations and the mechanism and, and so on to allow for such a thing. So I think this, I, I, I just wanted to clarify what I meant by national, as in the national willingness and support. Uh, but yes, I agree. I mean, banks, uh, hotels, restaurants, uh, uh, cultural centers, a variety of Corporates. things. Corporates. Corporates. Yeah. Um, hello. I think it is easier to protect buildings and even streets. I was in Syria about 10 years ago, and I witnessed the misuse of the locals of Palmyra was being used on holiday days for picnic areas, driving through with noisy motorbikes, standing on columns, being photographed, leaving food everywhere. How can you protect that? It's impossible. I mean, open spaces, I'm not talking yeah, about, obviously. Sites. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's very, very difficult. No, you're right, and uh, it reminds me on another problem, which is uh, more and more, uh, uh, evident, which is the looting and uh, illicit traffic, and uh, uh, we know that it exists uh, everywhere around the Mediterranean cities, and uh, we know that it's uh, such things increase with economic crisis, and uh, it uh, so it's in cities you, you can have. Uh, some solution with reusing uh, the buildings, etc. But you're right for the archaeological sites. It's um, another problem. I wanted to write to the Minister of Culture in uh, Syria, and my guide said, you'll just be one of a thousand letters. There have been a thousand writing about this problem before you. Yeah. You know, I, on the one hand, um, <laughs> I don't know how to say this, but uh, I think as much as, of course, we know that sometimes people cause damage, uh, unfortunately, sometimes the solution... It's misuse. It's no, 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 I understand. It's yeah, the, the solutions sometimes go to 180 degrees on the other side, where people are blocked out, there are fences, and people are not allowed to enter. So I think we really, be it, that's why I put those two contrasting photos. We need to find the balance where people are allowed in, but don't misuse, uh, but that they're encouraged to go in. So if we look at the bright side is that they're interested, they love to be photographed with the column, but yes, you don't need to destroy it to be photographed with it. So I think the problem sometimes is, is that we move from one side to 180 degrees, uh, either allow everything or don't allow anything. No, and but they have guards, you know, there were no guards yeah. around. Nobody yeah, protected the management anything. Of the, of the whole so side. it was the management. 
So, last question. Last question, Daniel. <laughs> no, it's not really a question. But so one of the hardest moments was um, when we were trying to convince the people there that we will exhibit contemporary art. And they were really, really, really shocked. And they were expecting to see only paintings and sculptures, maybe. But when they saw the big installations, they were really shocked. And then the most interesting part was when they came and told me, please leave the work and leave it permanent here. Yeah. And I was shocked because I thought they were going to kick us out. <laughs> and, um, and they were going to be up upset when they see like all old TVs and, and video art and everything. And then this, this gave me hope because I think people really want to see um, something different, something new, uh, something that will encourage people to come and visit. And uh, this can be the start. So I don't think yani, being like having national solutions can be a little bit hard. But um, trying always to, to prove that we're here and that we'll, that we'll do everything we can, the private yani, sector, uh, I think will, can change a lot. Yeah. I agree. And I think, uh, just two points on that. The first thing is that, again, back to the national, uh, you had the national support. If you did not have the national support, you would, you have to really, I think this is very crucial for you to understand that if you did not have the national support, it would have been mission impossible to display even outside. Okay, so I think that is what I meant by national support. I'm not saying that the government should pay or whatever, but if you didn't have it, it wouldn't work. Of so course we had it, but yeah. see, I think you're talking about, about a permanent national support. I yani think it has to be an agenda. It has yes. to be in Egypt that art, architecture, it has to be as part of our agenda yes. that we, ha we uh, support such initiatives. And it doesn't have to always be a suffering for an institution to come up with a creative idea that wants to bond uh, people to heritage. That's what I wanted to say. I don't want money from the government. I mean, yes, you know, I mean, that's not <laughs> what I meant. Happen. But I mean, if, if, if they should, but OK. And that's not, no, that's what I wanted to explain. But the second thing is also about our assumptions and pre-assumptions, let's say, about uh, people who live and use the spaces. And I think dialogue is very important. Also, when, when I worked on restorations of monuments, it was very important to talk to the people because in the end, we restore, and it's them who will use the space. So um, I think this dialogue is, is very important. And sometimes we have our pre-assumptions of what people will like and what people will not like, and people very often surprise us. So I think... Uh, we would love to hear more from you, actually, about how you uh, went about dealing with the, with the people. But I think if you will have a talk like that, please let us know. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, you want to say uh, final uh, words, maybe? Uh, no, but uh, uh, it's difficult to have a final uh, <laughs> word. <laughs> I think we'd, we could stay together during hours, uh, and of course we would like to hear you about the, the experience. But uh, uh, I'm not God, but I, f I have a good feeling about uh, this process going on. Uh, for me, it's the first year that I come to your event, uh, Art d'Egypte. I only saw photos uh, last year and uh, two years ago, but I feel that he, from one year to the other, he, it's more powerful. So, uh, of course, it's not enough. Uh, but uh, you are very, a lot of energy, and I think that, uh, and as you say, with the support of the, of the ministry, so uh, I think, uh, go on and uh, let's uh, meet together in one year and we'll see uh, what happens. <laughs> so thank you very much uh, for being here.